In my last video, I mentioned that I'm using Dr. Phil Mathletone's popular MAF training method in this 20-week base building program that I'm doing at the moment, but I'm not doing it exactly to the letter. I've made a few modifications. Today, I want to tell you all about those modifications and why I've chosen to do it that way. If you're new to the channel, hi, I'm James. I'm on a mission to lose the extra lockdown weight that I put on over the last year or so and take control of my health and fitness all on the way to running a sub three hour marathon, which is my main goal. I want to do that before I'm 40. I'm 37 now, the clock's ticking. Okay, so let's get into the main point of today's video. Let's talk about math tone training and the MAF method and talk about those little tweaks that I'm making to help it suit me, I think, that little bit better, but also little tweaks that I think you might want to consider as well. Just to give you a really quick overview of MAF training or math training, it's a method which was put together by Dr. Phil Maffetone and is essentially a form of low heart rate training focused on developing your aerobic system. In fact, your aerobic fitness is what underpins your performance in everything from 5K and shorter through to half marathons, marathons, and ultra distance races. In fact, your aerobic fitness has a massive part to do with your fitness in general, but also your general health. So for me, coming into this new training regime that I'm on, really trying to deal with some weight loss issues, some high blood pressure issues, some stress issues, this is a fantastic way of me training without putting excess stress on my body. That's what drew me in to Maffetone training in itself. But there are a few key parameters that are really important to understand. The first one is your MAF or your math heart rate, because all the training in your math training needs to be done below that math heart rate. And for a lot of people, that can be pretty frustrating to begin with. So how do we get there? Well. Phil Maffetone came up with a really elegant way of dictating a specific heart rate. And if you've done any heart rate training in the past, you'll have seen how many different ways there are to calculate your heart rate zones, many of which conflict with one another. This one is the 180 rule. You start with 180, you minus your age. Once you get to that figure, 180 minus age, you then add a few numbers, subtract a few numbers to really again, reflect your general health, your level of training, et cetera, et cetera. I'll leave a link, in fact, down in the description to a, uh, an interview where he talks about his training method in depth. But that gives you a figure. And for a lot of people, that figure, heart rate-wise, requires them to slow almost down to what feels like a walk. And for many people, especially those who don't have a great base of training, for many people, it is a walk. But the whole core of this and the way in which you, you see progress when it comes to math training is that although in the early weeks and perhaps early months, you may feel that you're running very slowly at this MAF heart rate, over time, you will find that your pace gets faster and faster and faster and faster at that MAF heart rate. And that really is the key to the whole thing. Staying at low intensities, becoming a more efficient aerobic athlete, becoming more efficient in terms of burning fat for fuel, which is huge, but also putting less stress on your body because you're not constantly smashing your body doing endless speed sessions and putting a lot of stress and strain on your body that you just can't recover from quickly. One of the key components to math training is it allows you to recover fast and get more volume in during, the, during a training week. And that for me is huge. In fact, let me know down in the comments if you've ever done any low heart rate training or you've ever used the math method because I'd love to hear your experiences with this. When it comes to my approach to Maffetone training, there are a few little tweaks that I'm going to make to fill Maffetone's specific program, which I think will really suit my body a little bit better than just doing endless, slow, steady miles. I know those of you who have perhaps seen success with MAF training will be rolling your eyes at this, but stick with me because this might be something you haven't considered. A great place to start would be to answer a few questions. So there are a couple of questions about this in the comments that I want to get into right now. So Miranda Chitty says, hi James, you've chosen under 135 beats per minute for easy training days. How did you get to that? MAF formula of 180 minus your age? Well, Miranda, kind of. We start out with 180, we subtract 37, my age, brings us to 143. 
Then from 143, Phil Maffetone tells us that if we're on any medication for an ongoing condition, which I am, my blood pressure medication, then we need to subtract another 10. That brings me down to 133. Now, I've had some lab, lab testing done in the past. Granted, it was a few years ago and I need to certainly get that updated, but there, upper zone two was 137. We split the difference between, again, 133, 137, brings us to 135. More or less scientific, not sure, but I'm confident that that figure will work well for me. James has a question around the weekly volume for the first 20 week base phase. How many miles or kilometers per week and does it increase over those 20 weeks? Okay, so I'm specifically not focused on hitting mile or kilometer goals during this base phase period. I want to focus more on making sure that I get a specific amount of time each week spent in that aerobic training zone, that zone just below my MAF heart rate. If I can do that, then I'll know that I'm going to be seeing the benefits of the, all this math training that I'll be doing, this aerobic, aerobic development that I'll be doing. So I'm looking to get to a point where I'm consistently getting six to eight hours per week of aerobic training in the bank. And as the block increases, there will be some bigger weeks where I take that up towards 10, maybe even 12 hours per week. Again, it won't be a linear increase. I'll probably build it up and then back it off a little bit, but I'm also gonna see how my body feels. That's quite a lot of volume when we start getting up towards 12 hours per week. So no hard and fast rules with that, but the goal I've set myself for this base phase is consistency in that six to eight hours per week. If I can do that, then fantastic. Above that, it really is a case of seeing how my body gets on. Okay, so what about the various different tweaks and adjustments that I said that I'm going to make to the MAF training method? Now, personally, I feel like it's a fantastic training method for building aerobic endurance and really starting to improve that underlying aerobic base that we all need to be able to run faster, whether it's 5K, marathon, or beyond. That's true, I've seen it in so many runners. Again, I've done plenty of low heart rate training for myself in the past, not necessarily strictly adhering to Dr. Maffetone's work, but I've seen the benefits. Now, something that I feel that it lacks is a focus on neuromuscular training. Okay, it's great for training the energy systems, at that, or the, the, the aerobic energy system in particular, but what about when you suddenly turn up at a 5K time trial and you are expecting your legs to be able to turn over quickly, you're expecting a smooth, long stride, everything that we know we need to be able to run fast. What about that when you've only been doing lots of long, slow miles? I think there is a real truth to the old adage of long, slow runs building long, slow runners. Yes, one of the key aspects of math training is that you'll find, if you're getting it right, that at your MAF heart rate, the one that we calculated from 180 minus age and then tweaked based on your own parameters, that you get faster and faster and faster and faster at that heart rate as you progress. But it's not doing much of a job, in my opinion, of teaching your body how to turn the legs over quickly, of teaching your body the, the movement patterns that you need to develop a long, smooth, efficient stride at faster paces. That's where I'm going to be just tacking on, and it's really, really, really a light touch of a tweak, but tacking on various different sets of pickups and sets of strides onto the end of some of my shorter midweek runs. So let's say I've done a, let's say I've done a 40 minute, roughly 6K at the moment midweek run around the, the local area where I live. I'm going to stop at the end for a cool down in a local park, but before I get into my cool down, I'm going to do, as I did last week, a set of six little pickups up to around about 20 seconds in length with lots of walking recovery, just down to just below, so just slightly faster than my 5K or my intended 5K race pace. Certainly not my 5K race pace right now. Just going up, building through the gears, teaching my body how to turn the legs over quickly. The key aspect to this instead of thinking about traditional speed training, is that this is not an interval workout. This is not an added part of a workout that should be producing any lactic acid, because one of the key aspects to math training is that we're not producing any extra stress on the body. Speed workouts, anything that has your legs all of a sudden swimming in lactic acid, really does 
well, they, they really do start to create a lot more stress and a lot more um, recovery time will be required off the back of those. The kind of dose of added fast turnover work that I'm doing at the end of these sessions is only enough to just stimulate on a neuromuscular level the, uh, the kind of the si think of it as the signals getting from your brain to your legs to teach them to turn over faster. Signals, that, uh, signals and pathways that wouldn't have been connected well when we're just doing long, slow mileage. The work is enough to turn them on, but not so much that we're going to make ourselves sore and tired. That's a key differential. Lots of recovery between each one of those little pickups or little sets of strides. And sometimes I do it on the flat, sometimes I'll do it uphill. Again, not a hard smashing hill reps workout, but just a little set extra on top of the easy run you've done just to get that little turnover going that little bit faster. Remember what good form feels like. Remember what it feels like to run fast. We're not stressing energy systems here. We're again, everything's very aerobic, but we're simply working on quality turnover and speed. There's another benefit as well on top of that, another reason why I want to do this. Because when we start turning the legs over quickly like this and start running faster, what we start to do is give the tendons, like the Achilles tendon, like your patella tendon, for example, like your hamstring tendons, that little bit of exposure to the kind of loading and kind of stress and strain that comes with running fast. Now, Again, small volume, small dose, but small doses of exposure over time will begin them starting to get ready and adapt for when you do start to work a bit more speed training into your program. I've seen it way too many times when people have done loads of low heart rate work and they said, right, ready for the next phase of my program. They jump into a new program that has fairly extensive speed work in it. And all of a sudden their body isn't used to this type of loading. Their Achilles starts to act up. They start to struggle with high hamstring tendinopathies, all those sorts of things. It's not something that I want for me. It's not something that I want for you. And a nice way of beginning to mitigate against that is just to expose your body to those loads while you're doing the easy training or the easy training phase so that you can just taper into the work where you're going to then experience a little bit more of that work, that, uh, that kind of loading on a more regular basis further down the line. I hope that makes sense. So really simple. I'm going to be doing MAF training. I am doing MAF training, but on top of it, I'm just adding in some low volume, low stress, low load, quality, neuromuscular work, speed work, call it what you want to call it, strides, pickups, but nothing that's going to make me tired or add to the recovery that I'll need between sessions. That, of course, goes hand in hand with all the strength and conditioning work that I'm doing alongside my running. And that's actually the topic for next week's video. So if you haven't yet subscribed, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Now, in the meantime, there's actually a video right over here, which will go through three of my favorite all time running strength exercises. These things you can do anytime, any place, just to build you into a more resilient, injury proof runner. Now, my profile on Strava is down in the description. If you're on Strava, by all means, come across and say hello. I'd love to connect with you there. We can talk about all things running, and I'll see you in the next video.